Welcome to Capture Store Verify with Authenticity by Design. So essentially what, what this talk is about is the work that I do with uh, Starling Lab for Data Integrity. So in this talk, we'll highlight the impact Starling Lab has had over the years, um, from setting investigative precedent to hold war criminals accountable, to giving underserved and overlooked communities the ability and opportunity to hold leaders accountable, to providing tools to help countries across the world protect against election fraud. We'll break down the Capture Store Verify framework used by Starling Labs for our projects and prototypes, then delve into how the authenticity by design principle drives our work and innovation. We'll highlight a new standard for keeping media and truth safe from link rot, denialism, and misinformation and give a preview of a new tool we are working on, which I'll demo towards the end of this uh, track. So what is authenticity? We, I've been using it a lot. A lot of people have been using authenticity and provenance. I think it's really important to um, define these. It means different things in different contexts. In the technical realm, when we say something is authentic, we mean it's tamper-proof or tamper-evident. Um, but if you're talking about ethics, um, your authenticity has a different word. It has different, it's different connotations. It means being authentic to your values. Uh, the authenticity by design framework encompasses both the technical and the values-based meaning of the word. So when we talk about authenticity, we talk about the true nature of a digital artifact. If something has authenticity, it's genuine. It's not counterfeit. It's also tamper evident. That means if there's any tampers made to it, it we can tell. Authentic data is trustworthy, is a trustworthy and reliable representation of the original version of the information. A lot of times when we see mis and disinformation, there's different ways to do it. You can edit a photograph and that's fine. You know, you can edit a photograph and that's a deep fake. Sometimes you don't even need to do that. Um, sometimes you just misrepresent it. You miscontextualize it. You say this, is, this picture from this conflict is from Syria. It's not from Syria. It was taken 20 years ago in a different place. So authenticity includes provenance. This is a really big word. This is a really important word. It is really everything that we do. It's the line lineage or history. It includes the origins, changes, and custody of a digital item. And we usually do this with cryptography. We seal each piece of the provenance with cryptography so we know exactly where it came from, where it's been, and how it's been changed. Uh, we also, part of our authenticity by design framework is preserving it. If you don't have this record preserved, it's, it's not much use to everyone. So it's really important that you maintain these digital assets with integrity in an intentional way to ensure availability over the long term. So authenticity by design is um, the, the set of values that we use and it governs how we do. The technology that we build in its own way governs our world. As programs and technology are written in program code, we're also encoding certain rules for how we behave and interact with the world. Authenticity by design is the principles that we think about as we're encoding these important pieces of technology that have an impact on the real world. Anything we design, we are considering integrity, privacy, verifiability, persistence, and accountability. So it's, not, it's a set of principles that we use to make sure that the things that we're building are, are maintaining these principles. What does integrity mean? We'll talk about ethics and we'll talk about the technical definition of it. In ethics, integrity is defined as being authentic to oneself and adhering to a framework or a set of rules. Well, in this slide we talked about what our framework or our set of rules is. So integrity at Starling Lab means that we're applying these roles in everything we do with a framework of capture, store, verify. We prototype workflows with authenticity by design underpinning it with capture, store, verify to produce and bind integrity metadata. What is integrity metadata? We looked at a lot of photos. When you take a photo on your phone and you look at it, there's a lot of metadata on there. There's timestamps, there's a location, uh, there might be a caption, other things like that. That's just regular metadata, and that kind of goes with the media. We, we um, try to create and preserve something called integrity metadata. This is hashed and signed data that proves exactly what a piece of digital media is 
and its origin. So it's different than um, a caption. Integrity metadata to be useful has to be publicly accessible. It must not contain sensitive information. We have to maintain that privacy for people. Can't have the address of a, vic a victim or the location of a human rights investigator. Uh, it must be verifiable. You have to be able to check it against the digital media it represents. So I say, all right, this is a hash of the location of this photo. You have to be able to verify it. Otherwise, what's the use of having it? It must be long-term, again, if, it doesn't, if it's not preserved, it's not very useful. Um, and it must be tamper-proof. So what we work on, we're, we're working to future-proof our collective truth. There's a lot of threats to it, deep fakes, link rot, the phenomenon of uh, URLs disappearing from the internet. Uh, a fact that I read recently, since 2014, almost 30% of the URLs on the internet are gone. They're broken, they're not there anymore. That's only 10 years. Um, there's also censorship and mis and disinformation occurring in the world that we live in because I don't think, I think the, the internet was a wonderful thing, but I think a lot of the problems that um, have occurred could have been avoided if you kind of thought, did a little bit of future thinking and had a framework underneath it. So for more than five years, Starling Lab has broken ground in the field of data integrity. We are an applied research and impact lab co-founded by the Stanford University Department of Electrical Engineering and the U University of Southern California Shoah Foundation. Our work started long before governments and tech companies recognize, recognized the threat of generative AI. So we've been around for a while before all this news about e deep fakes started coming up. Um, there's a big concern with things like the liar's dividend. It's, a, it's pretty easy to cry wolf against something and say this is a deep fake and destroy the credibility of it. So one of the main things that we're um, thinking about is if we can't trust our records, how can we protect our past, present, and future? We've built uh, cryptographic archives for, um, for world-renowned journalism publications, made some submissions about the preservation of evidence of war crimes in Ukraine to prosecutors at the International Criminal Court, and we've used centralized storage to preserve the testimonies of over 57,000 witnesses to genocide around the globe alongside the Shoah Foundation. So Capture, Store, Verify um, is, our, is our framework. To future-proof the truth, we've developed this framework. It's an iterative process, um, even though it's three steps, um, as you may want, you want to save many records in every instance of it and verify often. So we capture. We prototype apps, firmware, and hardware. So I'm gonna have some cell phones at the end of the day where you can try out some of this hardware and apps, to capture, di capture digital content to create a chain of custody from the moment a piece of digital media is created as close to that creation as we can. Uh, we use decentralized web protocols to reliably store content. Using decentralized system and advanced cryptography, we create verifiable proofs of integrity for digital information. Last is verify. We surface ways to evaluate evidence. So this is really important. We can capture and store all day and add integrity to it, but it needs to be um, available. Um, we evaluate, surface ways to evaluate evidence and check the validity of tamper-proof systems, creating workflows that surface provenance and authenticity information so others, either the general public or experts, can inspect and verify for themselves. So the basic Starling Web framework, what do we do? Um, we, we proto we'll, take a, we'll take a piece of hardware or an app and prototype how we can bring it through this workflow. We might work with a journalism fellow or a human rights investigator. We, take a, we say, here's a photo, here's an app, here's a cell phone. And we say, capture the photo and other, the photo metadata, you know, date, time, location, and more. We take this photo data and the metadata, we hash and we bundle it. Next, we have this hash and um, bundled uh, we have this bundle that is cryptographically hashed and we sign it to add an identity to it. Then we take this photo data and the integrity metadata that we've just added and people can verify that authenticity. This is very abstract, so I'm gonna give you three examples of how this is actually done. What's really important is that people can prove the data what was originally captured after we bundle and sign it. We also take that package of verified data for storage and we, with unique immutable IDs, content identifiers. Um, we do store and distributed storage with cryptographically unique IDs, so that means IPFS, 
Filecoin and other systems that don't have sort of one set of hands that completely control it. Putting it in distributed systems means that it's tamper proof. If you use a content identified system, you're grabbing something that is, you can tell if it's been changed. Uh, we put it in cryptographic archives because that's sort of like a, dis a decentralized store of something. If someone wants to erase a part of history, it's really hard to do it if it's in many hands. We register these things in um, a distributed ledger because you need an index, you need a place to go to to reference like what was the original and where did this come from. And then we also use tools to track and verify changes that are made since you capture that original bundle. Let's talk about some of the applications. The main areas that we work with are journalism, law and history. Law and history are really intertwined. Um, so we've done a lot of journalism collaborations with large and small room, newsrooms and even independent collaborators. It's important for, to the lab to field test these technologies in the real world. We've had the privilege to collaborate with some top media companies such as AP, Reuters, Rolling Stone, South China Morning Post, freelancers like Brandon Tausick, who's an incredible photojournalist, and how I impact local and specialized publications like Black Voice News and Bay City News. With each of these newsrooms, we identified authenticity-related issues and existential threats, such as link rot, the need to present and support evidence of war crimes, or the need to preserve accounts of what government or public institutions said, did, or promised, and hold them accountable. This is really hard if one person holds all that information. We also work a lot in lo with law and human rights. Um, records need to persist for many reasons. There's cultural reasons like the Mom I See War project where um, they, uh, we use numbers protocol to archive uh, collections of children's drawings that were um, recording, the, uh, or recording their experiences with the war in Ukraine. We've also worked on, uh, accountab with accountability purposes with the Reckoning Project, the ICC, and the UHRC. So one idea that we work a lot with in law and human rights is transitional justice. Um, when we capture these things not knowing if it's going to be used immediately, and it usually isn't. We need to preserve data so that later on down the line, a prosecution decades later, we have these records and we can prove they're authentic. It's really hard to hold people accountable if we don't have these good records. So we need to design more systems for this, which is what we try to prototype. We need to make sure evidence is properly authenticated as well as preserved while balancing needs for privacy and open availability. So for example, with Mama I See War, we wanted to make these drawings available and accessible to the world and searchable. We wanted to be able to prove that they were really drawn by children in Ukraine. We didn't wanna reveal enough information about these children to put them at risk. So we did things like redact um, the location or the, the last name of the children. But we hash and bundle them, so if someone needs to go back and say, hey, I need to use this as evidence, we can, produce, um, we can produce the tree of lineage of saying like, okay, here was the original, we hashed and bundled it, here's the one that you saw, it's the new version of it. Uh, you heard from Hala Systems, a social enterprise no, known for their civilian production. Um, there's the Sentry Hala program, their, their early warning system. There's a reckoning project where we collect testimonies of victims of war crimes in Ukraine. Um, we've worked with DFR Lab, that is an open source investigation that specialized, uh, specialized unit at the Atlantic Council, and they share open source monitoring databases with us. Um, we preserve some of their um, web-based original material they base reports on. And we've also worked with the UN, and, UN Human Rights Council, Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, and the ICC. They receive uh, authenticated evidence, databases, and claims. We have really big hopes in setting precedent with digital media and accountability in the court of law. All right, so what I wanna do is I gave you this very abstract, like capture, store, verify, these are the things we do. Let's, let's talk about what this looks like in action. We're gonna cover the DJ and the war crimes published with the Rolling Stones. Combating racism is a public health crisis published with a local California newsroom called Black Voice News. And the Taiwan election with numbers protocol, I'm gonna give a little different spin on that. So first thing, the DJ and the war crimes. What did we do? We created photo archives, we collected website evidence, and we had some of that website evidence, we had to redact documents. Why are we doing this? We are combating denialism. Um, decades ago, there were um, individuals perpetrating war crimes in Bosnia, and they were still walking free. 
there was no reliable evidence to bring them to justice. So we used investigative jur journalism, ZK proofs to do those redactions provably, and the Starling framework of capture, store, verify. So The DJ and the War Crimes is an investigative journalism piece headed up at Starling Lab by Sophia Jones. It's centered around a set of photographs taken by Ron Haviv, who's a, very gr a great photojournalist, 30 years ago in um, Bijeljina, Bosnia. This was the case of denialism. The perpetrators of these crimes were claiming they weren't responsible, and that, or even that they hadn't been present at the time. Um, no matter how powerful Ron's photos were, it's, it's really hard to get that to lead to accountability. This project involved piecing together the story of what happened in Bijeljina 30 years ago. Investigators collected ev evidence from disparate sources, not only photos from Ron Haviv, um, but archival photos at the city, of the city at the time to piece, together, uh, place, uh, to piece together the story and placing the events of that day into the context of time and space. The work of archiving included tracing the way this photo spread over the ensuing decades. This photo showed up in a lot of places, which did include people trying to manipulate it. This project included authentication of the photos, but went beyond that and used over a dozen um, cryptographic and centralized tools. For this project, we authenticated and preserved about 2,000 pages of payroll documents and witness testi testimony from a war crimes tribunal website. The official archivist told um, Sophia that, um, that they weren't public, but she found them on the internet, so they were. <laughs> um, they were found on public servers, um, and we had to assume that they'd be taken down once they figured out that these things existed. In addition, a lot of this, there was a lot of evidence on social media from these individuals um, and in, on open Facebook accounts, and we'd had to assume that they'd be taken down immediately. So even if we saved all this info, what happens if someone de denies it's real? That's what a cryptographic archive is for, and some of the tools are that we can use. We can hash and bundle it, add witnesses to it, and prove that they are what they claim to be. If you explore this archive, um, just Google DJ and the war crimes, it not only provides the media, but also a rich trove of um, metadata about the photo, but not just metadata about the photo, integrity metadata. For each asset, we have signatures from both Starling Lab and Rolling Stone that attest to the chain of custody. There's a lot of information in this archive. They have the information about where this archive was registered on chain. So as soon as it was hashed, bundled, and signed, we registered it on chain. And information about where copies of the archive are preserved. For, for somebody to take this uh, and, and you know, do something about this in the court of law, you need to be able to investigate these things. You can also see the C2PA manifest, which contains a record of what kind of edits are made. So it's hard to make a claim of fakery against this when you have such a solid piece of like, this is where it came from. And there were thousands of pieces of evidence from the, from the uh, tribunal website, from the archives, and from social media. So displaying the payroll records from this archive from the tribunal website was tricky. We wanted to show all evidence and tell an irrefutable story with multiple pieces of that evidence, but archivists had told us, even though they put it publicly, that it was confidential. Our solution, ZK redactions. We redacted certain pieces of these records, proving that the computations that produced, the, produced those blacked out redacted pixels only affected the censored areas. So we could claim af authenticity even after manipulation. The story had a huge impact. Um, after publication of the story, including the payroll documents with ZK proofs, local prosecutors in Serbia said they are now investigating this 30 year old cold case. The journalism industry also took note. Um, the story was announced as a finalist or winner for a dozen industry awards, including an Emmy, and several awards for innovation. To read the full piece, go to investigation.rollingstone.com. So that's the first capture story verify. The next piece I'm gonna talk about. Black Voice News, um, there, this is an investigative piece called Combating Racism as a Public Health Crisis. So public, there, there's a lot of public data that wasn't put together in a comprehensive story. In addition, public data is not as public as it should be. 
Um, uh, there was a lot of information on publicly owned websites. These websites might, you know, are, are hosted by local governments and jurisdictions. Uh, during the course of an investigation, 1% of the things that we pulled actually disappeared. And that was only over a, a month or so. So we captured and archived public websites from local governments and jurisdictions to preserve this public data. Much of the evidence for this project was online, but it was highly susceptible to disappearance, like I said, self-hosted. Public records requests, once these things come down, they can take months or even years to fulfill. So if you're trying to do research on, hey, is this government doing what they're supposed to do? It, it gets stonewalled by how long it takes to get these records. So what we decided to do was to archive these records with a tool called Web Recorder. What we're trying to do is hold leaders accountable um, for an underserved black community. We're trying to equip the underserved black community with data-driven um, information to address regional and systemic inequalities. Using Web Recorder tools to capture archives, the Starling Integrity Pipeline to preserve and store it, and a map built by the Esri Special Projects team, we helped build a data dashboard and a series of articles with authenticated media or authenticated web pages to support it. So this is the data dashboard built for the project. You can see, it's a fuzzy GIF, but you can see the platform has data spelling out progress in different categories towards combating racism as a public health crisis. Data, data and comparable statistics are necessary to enable underrepresented communities to be able to seek justice for racism as a public health crisis. These communities often don't have data to support them from traditional media and research organizations. So for them, the idea of putting this data in a system like IPFS, for a community that has seen the erasure of data that, that supports their claims from the, the big, you know, from bigger entities, it was particularly appealing. Looking into counties and jurisdictions, you can see the data collected and analyzed for each, so it was all brought together in one place. And that include web archives of this evidence. This evidence is preserved in web archives that have a verifiable display of the archive's authenticity and links to copies of records of the records on IPFS so that they can be downloaded and inspected, um, blockchain registrations of these records, and they were preserved on Filecoin. So let's take a look at what these authenticated web archives are. This is our method of capture for this one. Usually journalists will use a screenshot or maybe like embed a tweet or something from social media. Well, this is really problematic if we're trying to support a claim that someone doesn't want to follow up on. They often disappear. A web archive, so we, web, we use a web recorder set of tools, capture the full context of the page, including the code needed to recreate or replay the page. It captures all assets within the page and there's a more comprehensive audit trail. These archives were hashed and signed to establish the provenance. This is what a, for an example of what the data collected by a web recorder tool looks like. So you can either add a, a Chrome extension on, or we actually had a, something called browser tricks um, that we ran that does an automatic, it's like automated bot crawling, uh, crawling web pages. So once we have this full context, um, and the web recorder tool is pretty cool because um, it, they, they, uh, they hash the package immediately and they also sign it themselves. After that was done, we take this bundle of data, we also sign it to add another layer of custody or you know, not another attestation to it, uh, make backups, we add it to the P2P storage network that is IPFS and we register it on blockchains. So by registering it in these two things, we have immutable IDs, we have the content identifier, and then we have, um, we can go to the archives and look at the transaction ID and go to get the archives from Filecoin. So as a part of the mapping Black California data dashboard and the article series published in Black Voice News, you can replay archives of the web pages that make up the evidence for this. You can see the sources of the archives, the signatures and hashes, so this is the replay of one of the web pages. This is what it looks like embedded into the page. Um, you can see the sources of these articles. Oh, and they're also interactive. So depending on how deep you crawled, you can click on all of these links. I think this one was problematic because it was a database. But you can click on all of the links and, and see where it goes to and see the whole, whole context of the page. If someone commented on it and they want to delete that comment, well, we have a record of that. Um, so you can see um, the, the original URL it was taken from, when it was taken, 
the signatures on it and the hash of it. And then here's our integrity, inf or integrity metadata. Um, you can see the three registrations that we have on blockchain. Um, you can see, you can find it on IPFS, you can download it, you could follow the same process that we did to hash it and go check that the registrations on the blockchain in fact match. And um, they're also archived in cold storage on Filecoin. So the outcome of the project and data dashboard for now was an article in a series published by Black Voice News and they've won a lot of awards. Um, what they're hoping is that using Mapping Back California's dashboard as the basis for this reporting series, uh, reporters examined four local governments that signed resolutions that declared racism as a public health crisis. Because they were able to put this all in one place and support this evidence, they were able to write stories about, hey, which, which of these uh, counties are doing good and which of these counties are not following through with their, their, um, their wanting, what they're claiming they're gonna do. Transparency and accountability came up as a main public concern at every stage of Black Voice News' research and reporting. The public had a strong desire to establish a fact-based focal point for their concerns. So, yeah. All right, the last one we're gonna go over is Taiwan elections. So this is something that we worked on with number, Numbers Protocol. We used their platform and prototyped a platform that we're working on. It was in a capture, the capture was authenticated photographs. We wanted to use them for different purposes. Um, we wanted to be able to combat denialism, so have that authenticity information, but we also wanted to have, use those authenticated photos to collaborate on journalistic investigation. Images of this election uh, were very prone to claims of being date fakes or, or deep fakes occurring with this. Um, how did we do it? We used numbers, the numbers suite of apps, mainly the numbers of desktop app, and then we prototyped something with a UWASI content management system and a database add-on we call authenticated attributes. So the journalists tested out two different tools, one for authenticated licensing, the numbers platform, and one for authenticated collaboration. Um, so for this project, Taiwanese journalists set out to document the 2024 presidential and pre congressional elections. Tensions were high with pressures from mainland China and there was a legitimate fear of mis- and disinformation campaigns aimed at swaying the election. For this project, both Numbers and Starling Lab prototyped their platforms to equip journalists with authentication technology to report. Numbers Dashboard was a platform designed to enable Taiwanese news outlets and journalists to assign unique digital identities to images and videos to ensure their authenticity and mutability. This approach enhances public confidence in media reporting by documenting the presidential election's key moments with traceable and secure data, thereby countering misinformation in the politically and geopolitically sensitive context of Taiwan. The UWASI interface is a CMS that journalists and investigators can use to collaborate and upload digital content. But how do you trust the authenticity of these sources? Typically, journalists rely heavily on reputation and relationships Without a trail of provenance, a solution for sharing may not be useful enough a source to cite for journalistic investigations. With this platform and the Authenticated Attributes Database add-on, journalists tested out how they might use a tool to share information in the form of digital photographs in a way that was trustworthy enough to use as a source of information for an investigation. This is an early prototype of the authentic, Authenticated Attributes Database add-on. We showed how it could be used to show information from different sources and relationships between different photos. It prototyped how individually hashed and signed pieces of metadata, so each of these pieces of metadata is individually hashed and signed. Um, that means there could be more than one uh, piece of metadata that says, you know, what party is this? Or who was the creator? Um, they're both related to the same content identifier for this photograph, um, and it, can, it showed how these attributes could be used to give more context for the photos. Four of the journalists who photographed the 2024 Taiwanese elections participated to test out the features and feasibility of such a system. Authenticated attributes is still a work in progress, but we're currently working on another sort of front-end implementation of this. At the end of this, up next, at the end of the session, I'll be doing a demo of how you could do something like this. You could act, uh, capture a photo, share it with proof mode, generate a proof that does that nice bundling with the hashing and signing of it. We're gonna inspect the proof to see what it looks like, upload it to Google Drive within, 
which gen then ingests it, ingests it to the authenticated attributes database, where we can then inspect what's being done with this data and all the individually signed and timestamped attributes that are added on. So thank you all. Okay. Find out more about what, all the work we do here.